Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I'm tired. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I, I have a lot of energy normally. Today I'm tired. I've I've, I've worn myself out um, this week, and it just keeps going. How about you? Well, I you know it's so funny that you should say that because I was. I think it kind of segues into what I was really thinking about as I was getting ready for our shoot today, which was, um, and I bet this doesn't happen to you, but have you ever tried to like change something in your life that you're doing? You're like, you know, I'm really going to get control over like that thing. And you know, it's for me, for me, it's, you know, if I ever decide, Oh, you know, it'd be cool to lose a couple pounds. Like, you know, just be like that really tight. Like as soon as I try to lose like three or five pounds, I go careening in the other direction. Right. And I'm like in the refrigerator and I'm like eating things out of the, to, out of the leftovers so that, you know, I'm not really, eat. I mean, just my behavior goes completely wonky and it, it's the same thing with trying to get enough sleep or trying to get up early, which is sort of where I, I, I mean, I was in bed this morning. Like, I don't want to get up, <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, how do you, how do you change a habit? How do you deal with something like that? Well, I mean, I think we've talked about this a little bit, but my goal for this year was to become more disciplined around one specific area and to gain discipline <laughs> in other areas. But, and that was to get up earlier in the morning. Yeah. And so, because I wanted to exercise, I wanted to lose weight and, but yeah. it had to start with this one discipline. And so the key to getting up early in the morning is going to bed earlier at night for me. And so I started by moving my alarm clock across the room. Yeah. So I have to get up and then I have my workout clothes right there. So like they're staring me in the face, like <laughs> you don't, you don't put us on. That's a failure on your part. Yeah. So I think <laughs> and you don't even have to work out. You just have to put them on. But once you've got the workout clothes on, what are you going to do? Right? Exactly. Exactly. So I, I feel like, so January 16th was when I started that discipline and I probably only hit snooze, maybe five or not hit snooze. I've probably not gotten up to exercise probably five or six times only since then. But like yesterday, I, I didn't get up early because I knew I was going to go for a four mile walk with a friend. Same thing today. I'm going for a four mile walk later today. So I just know that at some point in the day, I'm going to have to get the exercise in. So I, I, I know that if I get, if I don't get to bed you know, between 10, 30, 11, I'm going to be really tired in the morning. Uh, I just want to hear from people how they, I mean, it, it's such a farce that we have control over. Like, it's, you know, there's so little that we have control over, including our own brains and thinking processes. But anyway. Put in your comment, put in the comments, what do you do to change your habits? We want yeah. to hear from you. No warmed over porridge. No warmed no, Like over real porridge. stuff. I want to real stuff. Like the real stuff. Yeah, you know, putting the alarm clock on the other side of the room really helped me and having the exercise clothes really ready helped me. And when, I, when I'm so tired in the morning, I say, okay, you can just get up. I don't care if you put your, I have a treadmill desk. And so right. I'll get up and check email. I don't go very fast, but I get on it. And I, I just say to myself, you can get up, you can put your head down and sleep while your feet are moving, just walk slow. But then I always end up, you know, running it out and, and doing, but it's just those little things that I tell myself that have allowed me to get to that point. So, so I feel right. like, I've, I feel like I've changed that habit. I mean, I've lost a bunch of weight, but I, I like love it. I think that's exciting. You yeah, have. It's exciting to go shopping in your own closet and you have to buy new clothes. <laughs> I know it's very good. Yeah. But anyway, I feel like that I've been successfully able to sort of become more disciplined in that area, which leads to getting more done, which leads to, you know, it all started with discipline at nighttime, getting to bed, getting up early, exercising, and then the other. So good for you. That's so good. That's so good. I know when I was a virtual employee for a Pacific Coast company, so they didn't even get started till 11, my time, right? <laughs> I was like, I was definitely like sleep until 9.30. No, I'd work until 7 or 8 at night or 9 sometimes, but so changing that. Uh, and now, but things do change over time. And I thought, oh my God, I'll never, but now I reliably get up at like 6.30, 6, you know, 5.30 sometimes. So it, it can change. Yeah. But sometimes the initial parts where everything kind of goes careening the other way is a little bit hilarious to watch and not that fun. <laughs> anyway. So um, what do you want to talk about today? I'm, we're coming to Memphis. I'm so excited. Yes. Yes. You're, you're taking your half of the show on the road and then 
y'all just wait till we get together in person. <laughs> <laughs> we need hair and makeup. I mean, I know that you're really good at your own hair and makeup, but oh my God, I am desperately terrible. You can tell. It, I am, I really need help. So okay. well, well, I, I mean, I, I've got, um, I've got our uh, shoot lined up so I can actually get that scheduled if you want. I really, really do. Okay. I'm talking to her today. So I'll, I know the makeup artist and the hair uh, person she uses, and so I'll just see what that looks like. So okay, and you can give me makeup tips while I'm there. <laughs> By the way, the um, you got to go check out the. I don't know if you saw it last night. I tried to send it to you in an email, but um, we were. It was so late. But this has been the hardest video to shoot. This really? Time. To edit? Oh not not to shoot to edit. It's been. I don't know why. It was. It was just. It was just hard. So there you go. But it turned out, I think, super fun. So tell me if tell me if you think it's okay to go live with. We really oh, okay. were like, hey Max, we want to be at the sellout show. And it's and it's hilarious. It's got parts like his dog comes in from time to time in the video and it's got little Twitter, it's got little tweeted outs and hint hints. And so we'll see nice. if nice. you like it. But all right. It's on private right now on our YouTube okay. channel, which you're a manager of and, uh, or you're an owner of, sorry. And, uh, if we have public, we can go. I just, it's pretty, okay. it's pretty, uh, it's pretty straightforward what we're asking. For. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is awesome. That was awesome. Okay. Um, well, here's what I was thinking I want to talk about today. So doing some interviewing, um, for sales positions, I want to talk about what do you think are the personal traits that make a great seller. Mm. And then also I'd like to get into what do you think makes a great interview for a salesperson? <laughs> <laughs> because I have some suggestions based on real life experience. I think that's going to be very, very valuable for our audience. That could be the whole, that could be the whole thing mm. entirely. Um, I wanted to talk about how you get yourself out of a sales slump. And we've talked a little bit about it before and we've hit on some things, but you know, there's a real emotional side to a slump too. And I, um, you know, you know me, if I don't close a deal in a week, you know, I'm like, oh, blah, blah, and then, you know, <laughs> then I close three or whatever. But, but I think it's super important because I think people can get stuck in that slump. And um, it takes just, especially if you're one of these virtual sellers, which we have so many more of than we ever have. And you're sitting in your own office all by yourself and there's no redemption and there's no one coming in your and your head starts screaming at you. So I thought yeah. we talked about slumps. Yeah, lots of head trash. Slump buster. <laughs> we need a good slump buster. Okay. All right. So, you look gorgeous today. I love this top. Oh thank you. Thank you very much. It's um yeah, again it fits me now. <laughs> so let's do one today because since we are coming to Memphis and we'll start to really plan out what we're gonna be talking about, but also I uh, commandeered Tom's office and he's like, Where am I supposed to work for this hour? I'm like, We'll just do one. <laughs> Plus we have plenty of stuff to edit. We've got yeah. plenty of Okay, great. All right, so why don't you kick us off? All right, so welcome. Welcome everyone to the sellout show where we are always sold out. I am Diana Guerin and I am the irreverent sales girl where my mission in life is to bring a dash of dignity to the art of selling. <laughs> Hi Diana. <laughs> Hi everyone. I'm Sean Carroll Sandy. I'm the chief revenue officer of the selling agency where we coach humans how to sell to other humans because selling like a stressed out maniac is just not doing anyone any good. <laughs> Although it does happen from time to time anyway. It does, but people smell your stress. Like, like <gasps> desperation and, and, you know, that, that, that stress sweat, that's a stinky cologne. Like people smell it a mile away. Like, no, get back. And they can smell it on the phone too. Yeah. <laughs> Very <Yeah>. good. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about today? Okay. I want to talk about what are those personal traits? That make a great salesperson I'm doing a lot of you know interviewing over the past couple of weeks to, and recruiting for a sales um sale, a sales team for a client and and then piggybacking on that i want to talk about what makes a great interview if you are a seller and you are trying to get a new sales position or if you're your manager sales director and or especially new in that role and you're interviewing people or a business owner what does a good interview look like? What, what should you include? And so we'll have sort of tips for both sides, I think. I love it. I think that's great. Um, fabulous. And I want to talk about sales slumps. For all you baseball fans out there, there will be a sports analogy. 
<laughs> oh, good. Coming soon. News <laughs> at 11. All right, cool. So let's talk about sales funnel. So, okay, let's kick it off. Let's talk about what makes a really, how, what are the traits of a great seller? And did you want to talk about the interviews from the interviewer's perspective or the interviewee's perspective or both? Well, I think, I think we could kind of talk about both and just sort of what I've observed and then what, almost like what could sellers do differently or what was good, what was bad, that kind of stuff. So um, I, I think, you know, the personal traits, it's, we talk a lot about the soft skills and, you know, I can look at someone's experience and look at their resume and think, Oh, you know, they don't have any great sales experience, especially for, you know, entry level, you know, looking at SDR positions, sales development rep positions. Um, I had an influx of people who wanted to get into sales and they had some customer service experience or something. So just coming through what, do, you know, how do you really, know if someone would be great in sales? And so one of the things I look for is, you know, what have they achieved? whether yeah. it's personal or, um, you know, have they been promoted in their job? Because, I, you know, talking to someone, I want to know how they've been able to decide on something and achieve something, right? Um, what else, what do you, what do you look, what would you look for? You know, I, I think it's a great question. And I, I think it very much depends on the type of sales role it is, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have a, is there such a thing as a field rep anymore? <laughs> is yeah, there a field I mean, anymore? Yeah. There's, yeah, every field rep I hire has to specialize in new business development because all my like, everyone, every every team I'm putting together for a client is uh, new. <laughs> oh yeah, well of course. So if you're gonna hire a field rep, they're probably gonna be a lot of them. A lot of their job is to be a hunter, right? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes those people will also be um, accountable for at least some of the management once they come on as a client. So I always look for somebody in that. I would look for somebody in that role who's somebody who really has demonstrated something in their life, like you said, and it doesn't have to be in a job. Right. It's something where they've taken complete and full ownership because those, the best reps in those positions are the ones who think like the CEO of their own company. They're the president yeah. of their own company and they have to manage all the different aspects of it. They have to manage up and they have to, they have to manage sideways and they have to manage themselves and they have to be, you know, really just willing to do whatever it takes because, Sometimes you're a road warrior. Sometimes your day's going to start at three in the morning and end at nine at night. So that's what I would look there. But I think it's really different for like an SDR role where you have to really be able to follow the rules. You know, you really have to be entering your information into the CRM and doing all that drudgery in the way that the company wants you to do it. And then still, but, it, but the one thing, but I think there is a common denominator of all of them is that I find that the people who it doesn't necessarily have to be college, but who are always finding ways to educate themselves and right. learn new things. That seems to be the common denominator for, a, for, for the great sellers that I have. You know, I have sellers and mm -hmm. some of them have had sales experience and some of them haven't, but all of them have some degree of that they've, they've really educated themselves and they continue to learn. That's the common denominator for the best. Yeah. Part. Yeah. We talk about, I, I asked a lot about, you know, how, you know, where do you, where are you getting your industry information from and how do you, um, you know, how are you keeping in, keeping in front of how buyers buy and yeah, being, being agile, being able to, you know, Jill Conrad's book is agile selling and is, is about learning as you go. And, and I just think that that learning mindset, I, I, I have a mantra when I started the agency of learn harder, hashtag learn harder. I love that. I want to learn harder than anyone else who could possibly consider doing what I want to do because if I'm learning up, you know, all this stuff that's going on up here, I'm learning that for my clients because my clients don't have time to go and be on Twitter all the time and, and reading books and, you know, look the, the plethora of books behind me and on the shelves and stuff right. like that. So it's my job to keep learning for them and being able to, to translate that and articulate that in their businesses. So I think that's really important. And you know, you know what else I look for what? in sales reps? is I look for someone who has almost like a project manager collaborator mentality, someone who can lead a team together. And this varies depending on what kind of products you sell, but for more complex sales, you have to go, you have to get this person and this person, this person on board. You've got to talk to IT and marketing or operations, production. You've got to go understand how they want their POs done. And you need someone who knows how to collaborate with people 
and bring people together and you know get the different viewpoints and get people on board if you don't have <laughs> There's some great salespeople out there who are missing this key. Mm, yes. They, just, they only know how to work with one person. They only know how to drive in one lane and one speed. And uh, I say they're, they're good, good salespeople, not great yet. But um, more and more often now, you've got more input. I like the, the informal buying committee, the formal buying committee. It's all getting bigger and expand, more expansive. So you have to be able to bring all those people together and know, one, who to reach, and two, how to reach them. And, you know, three, use customer currency, speak their language, get their buy-in, all that kind of stuff. And uh, that is a tricky one, I'm finding. People that haven't done it before or people that don't do it naturally, um, that's a tricky one. The good news is it can be learned. Mm -hmm. It really can be learned. Um, you, you have to go about the business of learning it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was a, I was, you know, this lone wolf solo thing for, as, for just a minute in my career, um, <clears throat> which it just doesn't work, right? I mean, you know, it just doesn't work. But I, I think that's absolutely right. And again, I think that goes to speaking to being the president of your own company. You know, everybody has to, all the pieces have to work together. It's the, the president of your company isn't the person that's just doing something out on their own. So yeah, I think that's, but what do you think about culture fit? I think culture fit is huge. And how do you sort of test for that? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I'm, I mean, experiencing on my side because most of the, you know, if I'm building a sales team, you know, it's been a very small, um, small sales, small sales organization with, you know, less than 10 people so far in an organization. And then to go and say, okay, we're going to bring in a sales team. And what is our culture? We actually do a bit of that discussion with my clients, um, a good bit of that understanding what kind of, you know, what kind of values do you want people to hold and how do you want them to demonstrate those values and what sort of, um, you know, characteristics display those values because you those salespeople sometimes operate on their own island. That happens less and less now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I like to use this analogy for two different reasons. So sales used to sort of feel like an arm wrestling match, you know, <laughs> there's a loser, you know, but now I think of it more like a symphony and that as the salesperson's job is to help everyone make music, right? <laughs> oh my God. That's so cheesy. <laughs> I mean, I, it's true. It's right. Well, you've got, I feel like we've got to cue the orchestra. This is going to be yeah. such a good video. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. You're, you're the conductor and you know, you're the conductor. You've got, um, both the, the client side and, and organizing and collaborating all those folks. Then you've got also a lot of times you have your own internal people, production and yeah. manufacturing and, and, you know, accounting and stuff like that. And salespeople need to be the conductor of that stupid orchestra. <laughs> And then you've got the nun that comes in and sings in the middle when people are discouraged. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, a culture fit is really good. And I think you have to plan for that too. You not only have to ask what you want, but you have to plan for that. So, you know, with um, one of my clients, we have a very small sales team to start out with and we'll be adding as we go along. But so we're trying to think of, okay, how do we, um, they re just redid the offices. So how do, and it's so it's really literally blank canvas, both in people and in physical walls. So yeah. how do we infuse the values and the culture here? And so um, the, the, the sales people we have on board are these young guys right now. And it's like, so maybe we can have like a, a painting party and we get these big canvases and everyone contributes to it. And they're like, yeah, no. Then <laughs> I'll buy the beer. <laughs> we're getting better <laughs> that they can get behind yeah so uh you know like we're gonna i've got these um nerf guns we're gonna plan a nerf gun party in the warehouse and i mean, just you know we're trying oh, to fun. figure out how to do those things and, and do some volunteer work together go out into the community and do that together because those you know fun and community are very important values to the company and the company owners so how do we you know translate that infuse that um the sales team so we gotta have some fun it's gonna be fun laser tech yeah yeah <laughs> That sounds like fun. I've never done laser tag or paint gun ball things, which sounds really horrible. Well, if they think I'm aggressive now, <laughs> <laughs> just wait. <laughs> well, so, so, but on the, for the sellers who are out there trying to find the right sales job, I think culture is super important too. And I want to give just a word of wisdom that I learned a very, very, very hard way is always make sure that you interview 
with the person who's going to be managing you. Mm-hmm. You know, like I was, I was, I was talking to the CEO of this company that I ultimately went to work with for like two years and he and I had such the same style and, you know, I, I just know how he built his sales and then he built a sales team, but there's, for some reason their sales people weren't successful. I was like, ah, I can change all that. So, um, I come in and it's the CFO who's managing me. So I don't even have access to this guy anymore. And I promise you somebody who's the CFO and the chief operations officer is not the right person to manage the salespeople. But anyway, um, it was horrible. She and I were, it just didn't work at all. And if I'd known, if I'd been interviewing with her, I would have gotten a flavor of what a day in the life really looked like and how they were doing sales. And, you know, I'm not good at just any kind of sale and it wasn't a good fit for either one of us. And it cost both of us a lot of money and time and frustration. So, um, as the seller, please make sure that you interview with the person who's going to be managing you. Yeah, very important. And if yes. they're not there yet, that's an indication too. What do you mean? Like if, uh, if you know, if you're, for instance, I've, I've seen in many instances where um, the, the business owners hiring for sales and that there's a promise of someone to lead them other than the business owner. And so that should make you very wary. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. There are a lot of ways that a seller really needs to make sure that they're setting themselves up for success too. Yeah. 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 Well, so that, um, so let's talk about, um, any other personal traits. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, there, you know, I think there's one more that I want to add to the personal traits. Um, I think that great sellers of the future are more of like evangelists for their company than mouthpieces. And yep. that's a very fine line. Um, you know, you, you and I both have, have seen sellers that they know the company brochure inside and out, but to ask them questions about how this works or to, you know, put themselves in the customer's shoes, it doesn't always necessarily work. So I think evangelists believe in their products, but they believe in what it can do for their customers. And they're out there telling people about it. This is the proactive part, like social selling and putting the content out there rather than just promoting the company. Yeah, I I 100% agree with that. Um, I think, oh, personal. I well, I think that's right. But I I think somebody who's actually willing to take a risk too in a conversation. Do you know what I mean? So that, like, I if I were interviewing a, and I and I have actually hired some really great salespeople, and they have. It's so funny because they have all sorts of different characteristics, right? Like. Some of them are really quiet and they seem shy and some of them are really worker bees and some of them are, you know, a lot more like me. I think one of the, I think one of the problems is we kind of fall into the trap of that they should look exactly like us or else they're not going to do well. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think that's necessarily true because, you know, of course I want everybody to have a great sense of humor, but you know, really at the end of the day, what I need is somebody who's going to, you know, land their quota and grow with the company and evangelize and, and their whole world that can't just be, the company, like you said, because I think you pull from all sorts of different disciplines if you're a really great salesperson. But, um, but in the interview, I always really like to kind of put somebody in the like a, a day in the life situation, either of the company. Like, hey, I ran into this yesterday. What would you have done? Right. And it doesn't mean that they have to get the answer right. But I'm really interested in somebody who's willing to take a risk on the. Um, and the interview, but also what's really super telling is people who follow up with me. I it's the follow up is almost more important yeah. than you know if they get back to me with a really lovely email, I mean, a handwritten note wins them like whoosh. Yeah. And if they come back with, you know, they reference something that happened in the interview that they've done a little bit of research about and now they see blah blah blah, or they send me an article about something that we talked about, I mean you know, the, the follow-up is almost more important and if, and they've got to be on time. If they are not on time looking like this is the first time they've worn those clothes since it's come from the dry cleaner, you know? Yeah. I think um, the three probably most important things for me as someone interviewing salesperson is God yes to be on time for the love of Pete, be prepared. <laughs> know everything you could possibly know about my company, my industry, any products. I mean, do everything you can, everything you can. I don't care. And here's the thing. I don't care if you make the wrong assumptions, right? Everything you can. And then the follow-up, those three things, because 
those are the three most important things to customers. Uh, yeah, it's the most important thing in a sales call. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I also like people who ask me questions about, you know, who else in this company decides who you're going to hire. I mean, like somebody, it, it, you know, we know what makes a great sale. And if you demonstrate all those things as an interview, that's why it's so killer. And can you even imagine if you had to hire like engineers at Microsoft or coders? I mean, I wouldn't even know it. it, it the interview for a sales position is so easy because if you can sell yourself in an interview, you can probably sell the product. So. Right, right. It's, I mean, that's a, it's a beautiful example of being, you know, you have to do in the interview what you're going to do. You can't say to an engineer, build me a car <laughs> in the interview. Show me how you build a car. Here's some, here's some tools and some parts. I think they do it at Microsoft. Like they put you in a whiteboard and say, write the code for this. And wow. then they, so I'm glad I've never been in one of those interviews because I couldn't write code. You know, the other thing that I like to do in interviews, especially for SDR positions is to cold call. I, mm -hmm. I have them do a cold call. I'll, I'll give them a scenario of who the cus customer might be. And then I have someone else set up um, who, you know, they're, they don't know all the gist of what this person is going to do either. They have their role and I'll have them cold call. First of all, if they freak out about the possibility of doing that, they're out. I mean, this yeah. is, this is a day in the life. If you've done it before, great. If you haven't and you're up for adventure, I'm not expecting perfection. I'm looking for, you know, can you think on your feet? Did you prepare as much yeah. as you can? Uh, and then just really how, how do you perform in a stressful situation? Because yeah, yeah that's what all this is. <laughs> it's all pressure. It's all pressure. Yeah, that's good. Actually, that's, that's really good. That's really good. Yeah, it has made it has made some decisions for us before it's, it's been the determining factor in some decisions. And I you know people have their own opinions about cold calls. But quite honestly, um, every single time, I don't care if it's a warm call or a referral introduction, there's always a first impression that needs to be made. Yeah. So you have to be good at making a good first impression. You have to be good at warming people up and putting them at ease and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, so if, you know, you can tell a lot from that. Um, it's a recorded call too, by the yeah. way. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Um, is my, is the sound funky or did my speaker just get funky? I think your sound is, it sounds okay to me. Okay, good. Then we're in good shape. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, uh, of course we'll edit this little clippy thing out, but uh, <laughs> I think the other thing too, you know, beware, seller beware, <laughs> as opposed to buyer beware, seller beware. Um, if you walk into a company and you can't get what the value proposition is, meaning like they tell you what it is that you're selling and you don't get it, it's not because you're not smart. They may not actually know what is important to their buyer. So if you can't, articulate what it is that the cust why the customer would buy this product then you know warning warning signs not necessarily don't go for it but you really want to be able to nail what you understand that company does before you right. go work for well, them well i mean if they can't articulate it um here's here's my thought on that if they can't articulate it they probably don't have a lot of sales support materials to be able to enable like sales enablement tools to support you in articulating it you right. may be able to figure it out but that doesn't mean that you're going to get, I mean, that means you're just going to have to create it and do all the, the, your own collateral marketing, that kind of stuff too. Which can be fun. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if it's a good deal, great. I mean, if it's obvious to you, but they don't articulate it, that's one thing. You're probably not going to get the support. Perhaps that's something you can actually negotiate in. Idea. Okay. Um, yeah. I think that's a very good point. But if you don't see the value proposition, run, run fast. <laughs> Especially if it's a, a, a commodity. I mean, if they're looking at it and it's a commodity and they don't know how their commodity differentiates or why people would buy it, if they're just, ugh, no. No, hire Lisa Dennis, the value queen prop, the, the, the queen of value prop. <laughs> she's brilliant, she's funny, and I, I love her. She's full. So good. But yeah, you got to get that nailed. That's so good. Most, I mean, how many tech companies do you go and look at their website and you're like, what do they do? Like, really, I have no idea what they do. And maybe it's just because I'm not the right buyer, but like, they all say the same thing. We're the integrated system solution that will turn your ROI and give you access to all your data at the fingertips. Yeah. I'm like, okay. They're, they're, I have no idea. The functionality and uh, 
really let's talk about the functionality, not even the output, because you can get, you know, if you start focusing on the output and the results and who needs these results, and they, then you can get to the value proposition, but just the functionality and the capabilities. No, and I, I think it's super duper important for people that are hiring salespeople is they get really stuck in, does this person have industry experience or, you know, are they going to bring their Rolodex? Look, the Rolodex very rarely goes very far. Unless you're, unless you're hiring somebody to work in a foundation where their job is to raise money and they have a whole network of people that they're used to raising money from, that could be one thing. But I really think that you can find some smart, interesting people and cross industry experience can be really powerful for your company too. So. Well, especially if, you, if you're selling a product, if your product or service goes into multiple industries, sure. you want people who have different experiences and different perspectives. Um, I've learned the hard way about that Rolodex thing. Uh, Tell me. It's, you know, we hired someone who had, she was in a, she was in a, um, an adjacent industry and, you know, we uh, went through the whole interview process and she, um, you know, she had a ton of sales acumen and demonstrated it and had all the, had all the right moves. And then when she got there, um, and, and we, we, we talked about non-competes, so she could, we couldn't sell the same product to those clients. That's what we were, right. doing. And, and she signed off on that contract. But when she got there, you know, she was picking a few people off the periphery, periphery of her um, list, and it just did not go very far. It did not go very far at all. Mm -hmm. And I think there were probably a couple of reasons for that, and some personal with her, but I just think that, um, you know, you may get one or two big you know, translations if you're hiring someone with industry experience, but you have to make sure that they've got the ability to make new contacts and get new clients on board. Otherwise they'll sit on that. It also takes a long time. They'll sit on those forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, and just cause you built a network in one context doesn't mean that network is even going to be interested in the new context at all. No, I saw that, you know, happened to office max too, where we hired, um, you know, they're big fans of hiring people with copier experience and copier background experience. You know, Xerox has a very rigorous sales training. We know so many people who've yeah. been through it. But just because you had clients that bought the machines that, that didn't always translate, it actually was always the wrong contact to talk about print. So right. that, you know, they learned that lesson the hard way too. Very good. What a very thorough exploration of hiring salespeople. That's very cool. I hope does that does that kind of did that cover what you wanted to cover? Do yeah, absolutely. I, I do want to I do want to hear though. What what have you found about assessments? Have you used any assessments that you like and that work, or what do you think? Um, about you know, I haven't used the one that everyone's so crazy about the OMG assessment. I haven't used that one yet, but I found that. And, and this is interesting because the one thing that OMG says they do differently um, uh, that all the other ones don't is they measure, will someone do it? Not can they do it? Because ah. all the other assessments, I've actually found the personality assessments rather than the sales assessments, much more telling yeah. <laughs> the personality assessments about how people think um, much more telling because, you know, um, I, there, I do a grit test. I want to see if they're persistent, if they can persist over time and stuff like that. But um, I'm curious to know, uh, I, I want to see the results of some of the OMG um, assessments. I've seen their demo, but I haven't, you know, other than that, I haven't used other assessments. What about you? Uh, I, we used to use, we used to use an assessment that it wasn't DISC or an OMG wasn't even around back then, but it was, it was more a lot about personality and we were looking to kind of complement weaknesses in the firm because we had only 30 people it wasn't a huge firm so um so that worked out really well but i have a great story um you you probably never have heard of this guy have you ever heard of peter burwash he was a tennis pro so he he was a great pro but he built this unbelievable business he was one of the most fascinating guys i've ever heard um he wrote the seven keys to leadership he's absolute i'm so glad i met him anyway um he would partner with uh, top resorts throughout the world to staff their uh, to staff their tennis pros at you know like the Four Seasons and you know across the world the tippy top resorts. And he had this rigorous interviewing process that people would pay 
to go through the interviewing process because they learn so much about themselves wow. um, in these interviews. And he taught me how, he told me some tricks of like, well, some of the tips of what do you do? So he would have people in rooms for really long times under stressful situations where they hadn't eaten for a while. And, you know, like it was, it was very stressful. Right. Uh -huh. And he, you know, when people get hangry, they behave a different particular way. Right. Uh -huh. Um, and, or he would pick the one thing that they did the, that they used the most to communicate and he would, uh, keep them from doing it. So if there was somebody that would communicate a lot with their hands, he'd like make them tie them, you know, tie them to their, tie them to their sides or, and I asked him, I said, well, what would you do with me? If we were in an interview situation, he said, I put a blindfold on you because you use your eyes a lot to communicate. So, so if they could get across a point without using their strongest communication tool, then that would be a factor. But here was the really interesting one that I loved about him was he would take these, so they're tennis pros right. that are interviewing for these positions. And he's strict. He's like, no, I don't think he requires that you're a vegetarian, but he prefers that you are. And no smoking, no drinking, no drugs, period, end of story. You know, these are people that are dealing with really high end sensitive situations with people and they need to be great with them and they need to be at the top of their game. So anyway, so he would take them out onto the court and be hitting balls with them. And he would never hire the guys that wouldn't pick up their own balls. But the guys that would run and pick up the balls on the whole court, it, that was his guy. And I was like, ooh, no divas here. Yeah. So um, anyway, I think it's really cool how he designed these ways to mm -hmm. actually put people in a situation where that could be very real in the situation that they were actually going to be in. So, I, But it takes a lot of thinking. Yeah. And oh, really yeah. smart, but you know, he got yeah. paid a lot of money to do it. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. Um, you really can learn about, about yourself. I love the stress situation. I'm thinking like, you know, like the the like the interrogation room where they <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it does take a lot of time, effort, and thought. No, no, no. What you do is you bring a salesperson in with a presentation that you've asked them to prepare ahead of time, and then nothing works. Oh right. yeah, yeah. Not, 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 like the AV won't plug in, and you're call and you call the AV guy. Could you come in? It's twenty minutes later, and it doesn't work, and and then it ends up never working. If you've got a guy that could do that interview, oh my god, oh my god, because <laughs> yeah. it happens all the time. I've got some new ideas to put into my interview process now. <laughs> <laughs> I will say it's not torture. We're not you know waterboarding, mm -hmm. but I think that. Stress test. I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer that, you know, you, how people handle stress and how they respond to those stressful situations is sort of like a mirror into their soul. <laughs> you may need to check with like some HR experts so there's oh, yeah. not any legal yeah. ramifications to what we're talking about here. But yeah, yeah. Please, please run everything past your HR director. Yeah. Now I want to be somebody who interviews repo guys or something like, go get that car. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, it's a different version of sell me this pen. Oh Lord. Oh, which I've never Lord. done. I think that, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the cold call is, is very, you know, telling and stuff like that, but you people, you know, you gotta be able to think on your feet. So I understand where that comes from. So <laughs> did, and then, did you read the, sell me, the, sell me my laptop article? I think I did. Yeah. <laughs> but the salesperson grabs the laptop and walks out of the office and two hours later he calls he's like uh could you bring me my laptop back he's like for two hundred dollars <laughs> that's horrible. i don't recommend that <laughs> well and so you know one of those traits we talk about is that for grit and that persistence and i think it's so important that people can motivate themselves and move themselves to get beyond times that are tough. So that, that leads me to talk about, um, you know, what do you do when you're in a slump? Uh -huh. you, you know, you're a practitioner every day. You are hustling. You're busting that nut every single day. <laughs> so what do you do? You know, what do you, first of all, I have a hard time believing you'd ever be in a slump. Oh, you, well, I think we define what a slump means for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when it, it, it runs up against a lot of concepts and sales that I, I think are still up for grabs. Like, um, 
are you killing your quota? Well, where did quota come from? I think that companies have to be really careful about, does it make any sense where quota came from? And you know, if you've got a rep that's killing their quota, do you just keep upping it and upping and upping it until they're completely discouraged and leave? Do you know what I mean? Like, I think there, I think there's a lot of, you know, so if I'm not, if there's this random quota and I'm, you know, not hitting it, it feels like a slump. Mm -hmm. um, also, I was one of those people in high school that, you know, I really wanted to have the next boyfriend lined up before I let this one go. <laughs> because I was clear that if I was breaking up with somebody, there was never going to be another boyfriend. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's how it is for me. When I close a sale, there's this like sort of, yay, for a minute. And then there's like, Oh no, I'm never going to close another deal. Where's the deal in my pipeline? Do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> a full pipeline cures all ills, especially when you're in a slump. But anyway, so uh, if you've got, a, you've got something to do and somebody to call on, it actually looks like they might work out. But, um, but I mean, I think it just depends on what your version of a slump is. Um, I don't know if you've heard this story. If I, I probably told you, but at 9-11, um, at Ground Zero, they brought in a whole bunch of rescue dogs. Mm -hmm. And um, at some point, they started having to bury live bodies in the rubble so that the dogs could find a live body and rescue them because the dogs were getting super depressed that all they were ever finding was dead people, right? I know that's a little dark, yeah. but that's, that's how it is for me in sales is, you know, if I've got to have a live one. i got to have a live one. And I think it's just that... Um, you know, that particular kind of addiction for me. But so for slumps, though, I like to go to what you say, and I bring, I remember it all the time when I'm having a day that nothing's happening, like no callbacks, no nothing. I'm like, it's just about the process. It's just about the process. Go back to the process. And then I'll like open up my scripts. You know, I have scripts for each client. And then I, I of course get off them, um, you know, because you never read a script, but you're, I'm like, why don't you go back to the scripts and see if you're like, have you taken a journey to like Southeast Asia here or are you still on track here? Um, so get back to the basics, do the process, mm -hmm. but also respect the streak. <laughs> so this is a Bull Durham, <laughs> <laughs> the Bull Durham concept, but you know, it, Kevin Costner once, uh, one time says, you know, if you think you're on a winning streak because I think it was having sex. If you think you're on a winning streak because you're getting laid, then keep getting laid. If you think you're on a winning streak because you're not getting laid, then don't give in. Like if something, I don't care if it's superstitious, but if it's working, working, respect the streak. So anyway, um, that was my little baseball music 11 um, analogy. But I, I just think that there's, a, I think what I want people to be left with is you're not alone. Mm, yeah. You know, if you're somebody who's got sort of that regular salesperson mentality where it's a, it's a, it's a very euphoric feeling when you win and it's very, you know, I'm not talking about manic depressive, <laughs> I'm talking about it's a roller coaster ride and yeah. there are going to be some days where you, you know, set three appointments with the decision makers and there are going to be some weeks that you don't set any and that's mm -hmm. just the way that it's going to go. But if you keep to your process and you keep hitting your activity numbers, and you keep getting back to the basics of the message, um, it'll, it'll work out. It'll work out. Yeah. You can tweak it and get better. So what do you think about slumps? Um, you know, what I, whenever I'm in that situation, I think you, I do some of what you're talking about doing too. Go back to your tools. Go back to your resources. Go back to doing the things you know you should do. But then I also like say, we got to double down. That means we just have to double down um, and do more, um, do more until you make it, you know, keep going, make more calls. I really do. I think that for me, if I was ever in a slump where, you know, I didn't, um, I didn't, so like at the TV station, I didn't get on, I, well, I had a few media agency clients, um, that bought some stuff because we just, our ratings sucked. If I didn't get on a buy this quarter or whatever, there's not a lot I can do to control that. Honestly, I can't sit. It is hard to sell the value proposition. This show is so great. I promise you the quality of people watching this show, though the ratings are terribly low, <laughs> they're going to buy your mattresses. Yeah. You know? Like there's not a lot you can do to impact with that with the agency. So I would double down and, you know, um, work the direct clients harder or, you know, in print, I would go and say, okay, um, what can I do to expand my reach in this organization or something? And so I think you got to figure out what works for you. And I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring another baseball analogy to this. So oh, my seven-year-old son plays 
coach pitch baseball where the coaches are pitching. They're not pitching yet. It's not T-ball. And so in the fall, he was on a team and they didn't win a single game. <laughs> they barely kept score, but they, the boys realized they didn't win a single game. It was just so disheartening. Mm -hmm. So we are about uh, four games into the season and last game they had a streak at the end where they rallied. They still lost, but they rallied four runs and the boys were really excited. And I said, you know, I think um, my husband's the, one of the assistant coaches. And I said, I think what I could offer to this situation is what I found with my girls in volleyball is that they are slow to warm up. So in order to keep that streak going and get them, he said, have them run bases, have them do, you know, have them like, really get their engines revved up so when they get there they've got all the nervous energy out and they are ready to go so last night they did mike had them run back to the fence and they it really had them you know revved up before they got in the game and they came up to bat and they were knocking it in they came up to play on defense they were running balls down and they won last night for the first awesome. in two seasons yeah yeah i i'm just i'm gonna lose my entire voice this Spring, yelling at seven-year-olds and 10-year-olds and all these games. Stuff. But I mean, that's one of the things that I'll have my sellers do too, is if you're in a slump, then, you know, get your energy up higher. You got to double down on calls, I, go, you know, run around the block first, clear your head, exercise is important, but just, you know, get it, get it to where you can, in that moment, your energy is high and you can focus and you're, you're ready to do it instead of letting all that negative energy, just like keep piling on and sinking you down and sinking you down and you think you're not going to do it, do something to get it, to get it up. Like run around the block, seriously run around the block and then come back. <laughs> really seat. truly do run around the block. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I take my dog down to the lake and throw a couple sticks. Although anyway, not tomorrow. Um, but we talked about this yesterday on LinkedIn, you and I, <laughs> I was having one of those days where just nobody was picking up the phone, Yeah, you know? And um, I was like, I am calling until I get something. <laughs> and, I, and then I did, you know, and, th but that whole battle cry of make one more call. I think yeah. if you can pull yourself to that determination, cause you know, we sit in our heads and we think that our attitude and our attitude does make a big difference, oh, but yeah. we think that it makes all the difference. But what really makes, what causes a result to happen is you take an action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even if you take an action with a bad attitude, <laughs> It can be better than taking an action, you know, than not taking an action at all. So, yeah. And I think that's your back. I, I, oh, I so agree. And I would add one more thing to that too, is, yeah. um, you know, I had this with the seller the other day is when things aren't working, like you said, go back to the processes, but then also go back to some success and trace it from the very beginning. Yeah. Trace it from the very beginning to yeah. remember how long it took and all the different steps it took to get there. Yeah, I, I handed a lead off to a sales rep and, um, you know, he's just been calling for weeks and getting a lot of voicemails because we're, some of the stuff they're doing is calling up into, um, you know, national industries with a lot of hierarchy, getting not the right people. It's, it's difficult to figure this out. And so he's had this one really cool success that we believe is going to be his first closed sale. Yeah. And it started with, he called and he left a voicemail, called, left a voicemail. The guy sent him a message. Here's the guy you talked to. He called, left a voicemail for the guy to talk to. He emailed that guy, called him again, left a voicemail, emailed the guy. The guy responded, then they connected and then they misconnected. And, and, you know, like 10, 12, 10, 12 steps later, this could be a huge opportunity for him. Ooh, so cool. whenever you get discouraged, I think it's really good to go back to those wins and, and trace back how they started. Go back and understand how it started and what effort it took you to get there. And then I think that that can kind of help you refocus and say, okay, well, all I have to do is keep calling and keep following up and keep going through and, and using my steps and, and the cadence and, and it will happen. So I bet there's a Sesame street song. <laughs> now you have to go find it. <laughs> but, but what was that one song? Um, Put one foot in front of the other, and soon you'll be walking across the floor. <laughs> Put one yeah. foot in front, yeah. Or maybe it was Manum Manum. Do, do. No, that's not it. Or anyway. um, Dory from Finding Nemo. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Yeah, that's kind of, I think that's kind of how I feel like when I'm in sales. So just keep swimming, just keep swimming. That's what I tell myself on the treadmill. Just keep walking, just keep running. <laughs> I love it. 
I think we should, I think we should end the whole thing on that. Just keep swimming. We'll, we'll see what we can pull up in the background without violating copyrights. <laughs> but go watch that video and see if it's, okay with you if we post it and then we can start promoting the little daylights out of it but oh by the way we one of our videos monetized and we have earned a total of 0 0.003 cents so yes. when i get to memphis i'll split it with you it'll be 0 0.0015 cents don't spend it all on one um but i think we're on our way to 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 a real audience here. All right. This is <laughs> just keep swimming. That's my fish. Connection is unstable. Ah, uh, just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Yeah. So that's um. Hopefully that's not copyrighted. <laughs> create, a, create a little uh, Canva for us, and we'll we'll throw that out with this video. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll do that. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Should we wrap it up? Let's do it. Let's wrap. All right, so I will, I will wrap us up by saying stop hoping. And start selling. <laughs> okay. Bye, Bye everybody. Yeah.